Amen. All right, here in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, I want to begin with verse number 10. This is, of course, Paul speaking. It's verse number 10. The Bible says this, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Verse 11, Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Then it says in verse number 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So the title of the sermon this morning is, What to Expect in the Christian Life. What to expect in the Christian life. Now, there have, of course, been thousands, millions, yay, Christians that have been saved throughout history. They've grown up in different cultures. They've all had, each of them, their own you know, individual personality. They grew up in different families, and they all had different you know, lives. They all had their own journeys that they went through in their own lives, personal unto them. But there are certain things that we all can expect as a Christian. There are certain things that we are guaranteed as a Christian. And right here, one is mentioned. I want you to look at verse number 12 once more. It says this, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So, notice it doesn't say might. You know, it doesn't say maybe. It says, shall, saying that you will. This is written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We can guarantee that this is 100% without a doubt true. And what does it say? It says, yea, all that live godly, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus, that will live godly, excuse me, in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. Now, every single Christian, every single Christian out there will not suffer persecution. There's a specific type of Christian that will. Now, I just want to be going over what, what are we to expect in the Christian life. And who I'm going to be preaching to this morning are not just Christians, but they are Christians that are living godly. Now, if you're not living godly, that doesn't mean that you're just going to have a cakewalk. If you just decide to live a wicked, sinful life, then the Lord is going to be chastising you. Then you're going to have to deal with Him. But if you, as a Christian, if you are living a godly life, if you as a Christian are keeping the Lord's commandments, if you're striving every day you know, to live a sanctified, holy life and to walk after the law of the Lord, I can guarantee you one thing, without a doubt, 100%, you shall, the Bible says, you shall suffer persecution. Now, in this context, I want you to notice that it's Paul building off of his own personal testimony. This is not just an isolated verse. This is him after he gives his own experiences, and he mentions them very minimally, if you know his whole life. He talks about how he has went through persecutions, and then he explains everyone. If you live godly, Everyone that lives godly shall su suffer persecution. Look at verse number 10 again. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. So he's saying, hey, you've known all these things about me, right? You've fully known all these things. Then he says this. Remember, this is coming off of the statement, thou hast fully known my persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Then he makes the statement, yea, and all. So it's not just himself. It's not just he who went through these types of things. And a lot of people today, especially in modern, lukewarm Christianity, a lot of people today just think that, hey, that was just for the apostles at that time. The reason why they just went through such hard times is because the world was just a different place. I don't believe that. I believe that this is inspired and written down by the Holy Ghost for me and for you, and it's relevant unto us today as well. So just as Paul... He himself went through persecutions and afflictions in his life. He, what was the reason why? Because he was living godly. You, if you as a Christian today in 2019, almost 2020, if you live a, a godly life, a holy life, you will also suffer persecution. And a lot of reason why these Christians out here think that, hey, that was just a different time. That's why they went through such persecutions. Do you know why? 
Because they're not living a godly life. Because they're not living a holy life. Because they're not standing up for the word of God. So what's the reason why these people today oftentimes don't go through persecutions? Is because they're not living a righteous life in the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that we can guarantee in the Christian life, if you are going to live a righteous life, a holy life, walk after the commandments. Of course, none of us are sinless. You will never be sinless. But I'm speaking of if you're endeavoring, if you are, are, are you know, every day, you know, uh, working at walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and living a godly life as much as we possibly can, you will suffer persecution in your life. Every, all, you know, all Christians are going to have different types of lives, right? We're all going to live, you know, people may move away from here, people may move to here, they may live in all different types of, of scenarios, right? But I can guarantee you, no matter where you are, other Christians in other countries, wherever they're at, I can guarantee you if they live godly, they will suffer persecution. They will be persecuted by the world, by the devil. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 7. All of the Old Testament prophets, their lives, when they are described, they are described by living in, in tribulation or living in persecution. There are different types of persecution and tribulation that you can go through. He Hebrews chapter number 11, excuse me, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 36 says this, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Verse 37, They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. So when Hebrews chapter number 11, of course, mentions the heroes of the faith as we many so know it as. When it mentions these great men of the Old Testament, I want you to notice how their lives are described. Does that sound pleasant? Does that sound like everything was just, you know, butterflies and rainbows and unicorns? Not even close. It sounds like, it sounds like a terrible life actually, doesn't it? When you just look at just the tribulations themselves and you just fixate on just the cruel mockings, being sawn asunder, right? Just all these horrible, terrible things, wandering about in sheep in sheepskins, right? They're, they're going about and they don't even have, you know, a proper clothing. They're living in, de in the desert. They're living in caves and dens of the earth. Does it sound like that they live just the most pleasant, you know, bountiful lives on this earth? This is how the men of God, the prophets, how their lives by the Holy Spirit were described. By what? By tribulation and persecution. Because if you live godly, if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. If you in your Christian life have been saved for many, many years and you've never suffered any persecution, I think you need to examine yourself. You, you, we shouldn't be going out and trying to start fights and trying to create this persecution, right? To go out there and just be an antagonist. That's not the same thing. You just by, just by simply living your life godly will ultimately bring persecution upon yourself. You will ultimately have people persecuting. The devil will see you as a threat. The world will see you as a threat. And you will eventually, you will come into persecution from the world. And it will, you will go through tribulations and trials because of the godly life that you are living. So you turn to 1 Peter chapter number 4, correct? 1 Peter chapter number 4. Where did I tell you to go? 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4 and I'll read that shortly. That is 1 Peter chapter 1. You go to 1 Peter chapter number 4. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter number 4. Also, I want to read to you quickly from John 16, 33. It says this, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. And then he says this, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So why are all these verses in there? I want you to notice that over and over again that we are being assured that, hey, you are going to have tribulation. You are going to have persecution. Why does the Lord feel that it is necessary to make sure that He informs us beforehand? That He makes sure that He, that makes sure that he tells us before these tribulations or these trials or these persecutions come upon us. Notice that He wants to make sure that we're aware that, hey, 
This isn't just going to be some flowery journey. You know, a lot of people think that the Christian life is like that. And that's why I, this is a good sermon to, to sink down into people's ears, especially if you're a new, a new Christian. Because a lot of people don't know what to expect in the Christian life. A lot of the people maybe that started just following Jesus, they weren't sure what was going to come. Right? They didn't know what was going to come down you know, the pike later. They had no idea what that type of life was going to bring. But the Bible warns you. The Bible tells you, hey, if you, you know, uh, decide that you are going to... Obviously, you get saved, but then afterwards you decide, hey, I'm going to live a godly life. I'm going to live you know, a clean, sanctified, holy life. I want to live according to the Scriptures. It's not going to be easy. A lot of people maybe are under the pre impression that, hey, it's just going to bring me just great peace in all ways. I'm just going to be blessed physically, you know, like this prosperity gospel that Joel Osteen and all them will preach, that's not the Christian life, my friend. And you are sadly confused if that's what you are expecting and that's what you are thinking is going to come. Over and over and over again, Christians are basically, you're promised, if you want to put it that way. You are guaranteed, is a good way to put it. You are guaranteed persecution if you say, hey, I'm going to live a godly life as a Christian. You are guaranteed that you are going to have a life filled with tribulation and trial and persecution if that is the life that you choose to live. 1 Peter chapter number 4, I want you to see this again. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says this, Beloved, <clears throat> think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. So notice again, he's like, why are you, why are you, uh, you know, so surprised, basically? Don't, don't be surprised. Don't think that it's a strange thing when a fiery trial tries you. What's his point? This is what you should expect. That's what he's saying. As a Christian, why would you be surprised by this? Why would you be taken aback that you have these fiery trials? Why are you taken aback that you're having to go through difficult times, through persecutions, through afflictions, through tribulations and trials in your life? Don't think it's strange. You shouldn't think that it's strange. So he doesn't want us to be surprised. That's why the Lord tells us these things. He tells us beforehand that, hey, this is what the Christian life entails. It's a package deal. That if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to serve the Lord, and you're going to live a godly life. Do you know what else you're going to have? Guaranteed 100% you're going to have persecution in some form and fashion. You're going to have affliction. That wasn't just exclusive to Paul because he's just this great Christian. That wasn't just exclusive to all of the apostles because of the time that they lived in and because of the, you know, the way that they lived their lives. No, the reason why they were persecuted was because they were godly Christians. And if you in your life, you never go through any kind of persecution in your life, you need to examine yourself. You need to look and see, hey... You know, am I living a godly life? Am I walking, you know, a righteous path? The Lord want, doesn't want us to be taken aback. He wants us to be aware and even tells us, don't think it's strange. This is what you should expect if you live a godly Christian life. As Christians, this is what we should expect. So I want to answer a couple of questions for you this morning. One of the questions is, who goes through uh, persecutions or who goes through tribulations? Because I just want to speak about tribulations in general because they can come from different directions, right? Who goes through uh, uh, tribulations? Christians go through them, but specifically those that are living godly. Those that are living godly. I want to answer the second question is, how should we react? How should we react? That, of course, here in verse number 12, when the Lord makes the statement, when He says, you know, don't think it's strange, what does He not want them to do? What do a lot of people do when they go through persecutions and tribulations and trials? What do they do? How do they react? They give up or they become what? Discouraged. So He's saying, hey, don't be surprised by this, right? He doesn't want them to be surprised. He doesn't want them to be taken back. A lot of people, they may become discouraged. They may, you know, want to give up. They may want to leave the church. They may want to, you know, stop living, a, a, you know, a, a life according to Scripture. Maybe if somebody stood up for the Bible and somebody persecuted that person, you know, their response may be, well, hey, I'm not going to stand up for the Bible again, you know? Maybe if a, t a person went out soul winning for the very first time and they went to a door and knocked on a door and it's just like, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, one of these just raging atheists just waiting for a Christian to knock on their door and they just scream and yell at them. They may feel like, hey, I don't want to go n door knocking anymore. What, isn't that a form of persecution at least? Obviously, it's not the, you know, the afflictions, the, the full, you know, afflictions and persecutions that Paul went through. But isn't that a form of persecution and affliction? And a lot of people, maybe if they went soul winning and they had discouragement like that, they may say, hey, I don't want to go soul winning anymore. If it was maybe their first time or they were new to it. That's how people are in the Christian life in general. When they're new to the Christian life, 
If, if you're going to quit, you're normally going to quit in the first few years. If you're going to give up, it's normally going to be in the beginning. It's normally going to be when you're newer to Christianity. So that's why God warns you. That's why he's telling his disciples before he leaves. That's why he says, hey, don't be surprised by this. Don't think that this is something strange. You should expect this. You know what we should do is we should be prepared for it. So what should be our response? This is the answer to the second question. What should be our response? Look at verse number 13. But rejoice. I want you to notice that. He's, he's telling them, hey, when this happens, don't think that it's strange. Don't be surprised, but rejoice. Do you know what, as a Christian, your response should be when you go through tribulation and persecution and trials? Rejoice. You should be happy. You should rejoice. Now, doesn't that seem kind of like counterintuitive? Like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Wouldn't you think so if you heard this out of any, any kind of, you know, setting outside of the Bible? Like, that's the worst advice I've ever been given. You know, I'm going to go to somebody else for advice, right? But of course, you know, oftentimes we read things in the Bible because, you know, we're, we are, uh, you know, um, we have a shallow understanding, right? We don't know all things. So sometimes when you hear the truth, it doesn't sound right to you. That's because you're wrong. Because you're on the other side. You hold a position that doesn't, you, you know, we don't know all things, right? So, you know what your response should be? It should be to rejoice. Look at verse number 13. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So, he gives us a little bit of an answer of why we should rejoice there. And why is it? Just like how Christ had to go through the suffering. Just like how Christ went through persecution and affliction and trials and hard times. That shows just like how he went through that and then later received his glory. You also going through persecutions and sufferings and trials. This is an evident proof like it says in 2 Thessalonians 1. It's an evident proof of you, you are going to receive joy later. That you are going to receive glory later. I want you to go to, now go with me to um, James chapter number 5. James chapter number 5. I want to give you a practical reason. So that's one of the encouragement reasons why you should you know, uh, uh, rejoice when you go through persecutions. That's one of the reasons of encouragement. Is that because... That's just proof that you are going to later receive glory when Christ comes. Going through the sufferings now, just like how Christ had to first go through persecutions and sufferings. You know, uh, like when uh, uh, Jesus is walking with the, the men, the two men on the road to Emmaus. You know, when he rebukes him, he's like, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and then to enter into his glory? So that had to take place first. He had to go through the sufferings, the persecutions, the trials first, and then he entered into his glory. And this is an evident token of our salvation. This is when you're being persecuted by the world. That's what the Bible teaches. So this can be an encouragement to you when you're going through these hard times. That just shows, that can show you, hey, you're living a godly life. Hey, you're living a good godly life, just like 2 Timothy told us. That you're living a godly life, and that's the reason why you're receiving persecution. But I want to give you a practical reason on why we are to rejoice. First here, look at James chapter number 5. I want you to look with me at verse number 10. James chapter number 5, verse number 10. The Bible says this, Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Patience is, is like enduring in the King James Bible. Look at verse number 11. Behold, we count them happy which... Endure. So I want you to notice again, how did they react? How did the prophet? So he's saying, hey, let me give you an example. Since you're going through affliction, since you're going through persecution, and you're going through a hard time, I want to give you an example of someone else who went through it the right way, and I want you to look and see what they did. What did they do? He said, behold, we count them happy. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. What did 1 Peter tell us? Chapter 4, it said, rejoice. And what did the prophets do of the Old Testament? The prophets we read about that went through hard times in Hebrews chapter number 10. What did they do? And the, even still that they went through these, these cruel mockings, scourgings, you know, this horrible persecution that, that none of us, of course, have endured. It doesn't mean that we might not, depending on how things change. But hey, none of us have went through that. But we do have an example that we can look to. And you know how that you should react when this comes about? You should be happy. You should 
rejoice. It says, we count them happy which endure. And then he says, ye have heard of the patience of Job. So I want you to notice that Job specifically is mentioned there. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. I want you to go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. I'm going to read to you from Job chapter 23 verse number 10. I'm going to read to you from Job's own mouth. So he's supposed to be our example. He rejoiced. He was happy. Why is it a good thing? Because of course if we, he wants us to rejoice and be happy, that means that there must be something good. There must be a reason to rejoice. There must be a reason to be happy. And I'll read to you why. Job chapter number 23 verse number 10. Job understood this. He said this, But he knoweth the way that I take. And then he says this, When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So what is a trial? What, why do we refer to it as a trial? Why do we refer to it specifically as a trial? Because it's being likened unto, oftentimes throughout the Bible, we, are, we when we go through persecutions or when we go through hard times, you know, tribulations, if you will, when we go through these hard times, that trial is being likened unto gold or, or any type of precious metal. When they are taken, what happens is that metal is taken when it's dug up out of the earth, when you locate it, maybe you buy it from somebody who does the digging, right? Right? And maybe you're some kind of goldsmith. So you purchase it from a guy who does the excavation work. You know what you do is, you know, you, you take it and you probably have some kind of instrument or you, utensil or something that you'll set the gold on. And you'll crank up your furnace to a specific degree. Right? You'll put it at a very specific temperature. Of course, all different metals, they have different melting points. They have different chemical properties, right? So they'll set it at that temperature of where that gold is going to melt. You know what you do is you take that gold and you put it into the fire. And after a period of time, what it does is it cleanses the gold. It purifies the gold. Now, after you know, a certain amount of time, you know, I'm not a goldsmith, so I don't know how long it takes for this process to, to, to be completed. The goldsmith the gold, will go back and he'll pull out the tray or he'll pull out the instrument. And the gold will look entirely different. And the reason why is because it's been cleansed. It's been purified. You know, obviously there's other steps, you know, they'll buffer it, they'll polish it and all of that. But what it does is it gets rid of the dross. It gets rid of all the bad portions of it, right? All of the impurities. And down at the bottom of the furnace, if you open up the furnace and you look down at the bottom, what you're going to find is all the impurities down there. That's the dross. And then the goldsmith has to go in there and he has to pick it and shovel it out. He's got to get all of it out and he just, well, you know what he does with that stuff? You think he keeps it? They throw it away. It's, it's reprobate. It's rejected, right? Like Jeremiah tells us. It, you reject it. You don't use it, right? You've gotten rid of all the impurities. Now, no one in here is perfect. Not a single person sitting here, and you're not going to be perfect even at the end of your life. You have a lot of impurities. You have a lot of you know, uh, uh, flaws in your life. And, and the, the younger we are as a Christian, and the newer we are to the journey of Christianity, the more impurities we're going to have. And you're never going to get to the point where you're perfect. But do you know what's going to take place throughout your life? You're going to continually go through trials and persecutions and tribulations. And these may come in different forms. They may come in different ways, right? Different, you may you know, uh, encounter these in all different areas of our life. And these trials, we may view them as they're bad, right? Fire, does that sound like it's a good thing? Does that sound pleasant? Of course not. It doesn't sound like it's enjoyable, does it? No, so we may view these tribulations and trials as just being bad. Hey, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go through that, especially when you're in the midst of them. But Job understood while he was in the middle of his trial that what was going on was that the impurities were being taken off. And at the end of this trial, and at the end of this persecution, that he was going to come forth more pure. That it was, gonna, it was going to purify him more so. And at the end of it, he was going to come forth as, he says, as gold. And that's why we should rejoice. Practically, the reason why we should rejoice is that these trials and these tribulations are actually helping you in your Christian life. They are bettering you in your Christian character and in your Christian virtue. Every trial and tribulation that you go through in your Christian life, you're learning a new lesson. You're learning a new lesson, something maybe they... And, and, and they're obviously not all the same. 
you know, you're going to go through some, you may have some of the same ones, right? Some of the same types of things that you encounter. But every single situation that you go through that's hard in your life is not the same. You know, most of them are very different from one another. And you know what you're going to do is you're going to learn new things. You're going to learn different things from each trial while you're growing in your Christian life. Every persecution, every problem that arises in your life, you're going to learn something new. So later on, if you happen to encounter this same problem again, you know what you're going to know? You're going to know exactly how to respond. You're going to know exactly the right decisions to make. Showing that you are a better Christian, that you are a stronger Christian later in your life. So I had you go where? Where were you? 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read to you also. You're in 2 Corinthians. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter number 5, verse number 1 through 3 says this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Right there you're told why you should rejoice or why you should glory in tribulations. Why? Because it's bettering you as a Christian. You know what it's teaching you? It's teaching you patience. It's teaching you endurance. It's teaching you to endure. You have one of two choices when you encounter persecution, affliction, trials, and tribulations. You know what they are? You either quit or you fight. You either just give up or you keep enduring. And you know what? Until you actually go through resistance or until you actually encounter serious opposition or trials and tribulations, you don't learn how to fight. You don't learn how to endure. You don't learn how to have, like the Bible words, it patience. And the Bible teaches that when you go through tribulation that you should rejoice and you should glory. And you know the reason why? Because you're learning how to fight. You're learning how to endure. You're learning and you are becoming a stronger Christian over time. So each time when you go through some sort of problem or trial, you have one of two choices. You can either quit or you can either keep fighting. And after you've fought through one battle, after you've made it through one hard time in your Christian life, you're going to be that much more prepared for the next battle. You know, who would you, rather, who would you rather send forth into the military? You know, these guys over here who are experienced, who've actually faced hand-to-hand -hand combat, or these guys over here that have been, just been training in a warehouse somewhere? Of course you'd rather have those that actually have what? Experience. Those that have actually went through it and they've endured it and they've understood it, right? They've experienced it. That's why we should glory. We should glory because we're learning something. We should glory because it's making you stronger and it's preparing you for the next persecution. It's preparing you for the next tribulation. It's making you so that you will be strong enough to face the next fight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 1, we have a New Testament example of this outside of Paul, of course. It says, Moreover, brethren... <clears throat> We do, we do you to wit, or to know, of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of, of affliction, so this is a big trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So I want you to notice that out of this tribulation and out of this persecution that these people faced, what did they do? What was their response? To give up? No, their response was to abound. What did they decide to do? They decided to do more. Some people, when they face trials and tribulations and persecutions, some people, when they go through a hard time, through discouragement, whatever it may be, they don't feel like coming to church, whatever it may be, one person may feel like giving up. But there might be another person who just uses this as an opportunity to fight a little harder. Uses this as an opportunity to strengthen their Christianity and to move, fur and to move further. Christi your Christianity is never going to be perfect. Your Christian life is never going to be perfect. Everything's never going to be perfect and right in every place, all the time. It's going to be a bumpy ride until the day you die. 
And you just need to get used to it from beginning to end. It's never going to become smooth. It's never going to become easy. It's never just going to be just rainbows, as I said, and butterflies. Just this, this you know, uh, uh, utopia. It doesn't exist on this earth. There will be no peace. My pastor used to say this all the time. There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. It's never going to be perfect, ever. You're never going to encounter that on, while you're in this flesh and on this earth, ever. See, all you need to do as a person, it's up to you. You're going to go through these trials and tribulations, but you as a person need to decide that, hey, I'm going to endure. I'm going to fight through this discouragement. I'm going to fight through these hard times. You know, somebody maybe leaving the church could discourage you, of course. But do you think the right thing would do would be for you to leave the church too? For you to give up or you to fall out of Christianity? Do you think that if someone here is maybe not doing what they should be doing in their Christian life, do you think that the right thing to do would be to just follow their act? Let's just do what they're doing. Do you think that that's going to help anything? Hey, let's say that our next door neighbor is you know, a saved Christian or something like that. And, or let's just say maybe your best friend. That he all of a sudden is not reading his Bible as much, right? He's not, you know, just not living a strong Christian life. Do you think it would help you just to, through discouragement, to do what he's doing? Of course not. You know what you need to do is, you need to go through the trial and the tribulation and fight. And you know what's going to happen is, later on, when you encounter this discouragement, when you go through this hard time later on in your life, you're going to be even more so prepared for it. So the Lord gives us the instructions for us to follow. He gives us the pattern for us to follow so that we have an example. And everyone's going to go through this. Every person in here is going to go through times of discouragement and looking at others and saying, Hey, you know, you know, I, you know it's, it's, that person's pulling me down, if you will. And you look at maybe how they're living and what they're doing, and it can discourage you. Maybe not wanting to come to churches often, right? Maybe they don't go soul winning as much. These things can be a discouragement. Right? Maybe even just, maybe you have a, you know, a Christian friend that's just like completely forsaken the Lord, is living a sinful life. Right? I've had that in my life where they just completely forsake the Lord. They totally go back to the world. They're just living just a horribly sinful life. You know, you know what one of the responses could be? Discouragement. And I've had that. A lot of discouragement. I had a, 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 a very close friend that attended the church with me. And his wife, and he had something he, that he went through with his wife, a horrible situation, and the guy just completely gave up afterwards. Totally fell out of church, completely gave up on God. I think he goes back to a Baptist church now. Not very often, and he's not going soul winning. I would assume that he's not you know, reading his Bible often. There's different responses that, that, that could have came about of that. Can you imagine, even if, even if, let's say, that his wife, and of course in this case, never came back to him or anything, but can you imagine how much stronger of a Christian that that man would have been if he would have just kept trucking through? If he would have just continued on? Not only is it good for you, because you come out better on the other end and you learn things, but do you know what you do? You go through trials and you go through persecutions and tribulations, and now you have an example that you've went through. And you've gained all these skills, and you know what you can do? You can help others through their discouragement. You can help others. When they start to get into that same place in their life, you can go to them and say, Hey, I've been through this before. I know exactly how you feel. This, what, you know, you, this is not the right way to go. This is what you need to do. So when you, when you go through this, you get rid of all those impurities. You learn new things. You get rid of the bad things sometime in your life. There are different types of trials and tribulations. This is very general. There's all different types of stuff that we could go through. It may be a sin that you get out of your life. It may be, you know, that you just learn a new virtue, right? But you know what you can do still with the things that you learn, everything that's added, you become a, a, you know, a better Christian? You can help others that maybe have never went through this. You can help a person maybe that has never you know, experienced what you're experiencing. And you can go to them and say, hey, I actually had this exact, almost this exact scenario happen. And this is what happened to me. And, and, and even if you, you know, maybe failed one time in a, in a tribulation or a trial, and you did give up, but you came back, then you can, you can show them, you know, and everybody has this in their life as well, you can say, hey, let me give you my experience for being a bad example and what happened when I made the bad choice in this type of situation. So not only does it help you for the new virtues that you obtain or you acquire, but it can help other people because you can use your testimony and your experience 
as a, a, a benefit to others. So it's not always about us. We need to think about other people. We need to think about everybody else that's around us, right? I want you to go to, uh, um, go to James chapter number 1. Since you're in the book of James, that makes the most sense. I want you to notice this, this pattern over and over again. So notice he, he talked about in uh, um, James chapter 5, he mentioned Job. <clears throat> Earlier when we read in James 5, he mentioned Job. I read to you directly from Job's mouth, and he talked about when he, when he was tried that he came forth as gold. James chapter number 1, verse number 3 says this, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Same thing that was taught in Romans chapter number 5. What is patience? It's endurance. You know what it, it does? It teaches you how to fight. So if you've never been into a fight, obviously you don't have experience. But if once you've been into a fight, been into a fight, now you have that experience of how to endure. So the next time that you face this trial or tribulation, then you're going to be prepared. Now you have this nerve, new virtue of what? Of endurance. You know how you've been through it once, you've experienced it, you know how to respond, how to act, you understand it. So you know what you do? Now you endure when you, when you go through this, this next you know, trial or tribulation or maybe a persecution by the world, whatever it may be. You endure through it. You push through it because you've already experienced it and now it works patience. You understand and you grow and, and learn patience. Zechariah 13.9 says this, And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and will, tr will, re will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. And that's specifically talking about the Christians that are going through the tribulation. It says that they're going to be refined. They're going to come out at the end of the tribulation. At the end of that period of time, they're going to be even better Christians than they were in the beginning. They're going to be far you know, more mature. They're going to be far better Christians in all areas, I'm sure. Those that are able to endure through the tribulation, that is, than they were in the beginning. Why? Because they went through certain, they learned lessons that they could have never learned. There are certain lessons that you learn from different types of tribulation. You, you acquire these, this new knowledge from you know, this particular problem that you go through. Right? Uh, <clears throat> First Peter chapter number 1. Did I have you turn anywhere yet? Go to Ezekiel 22. I'm going to have you turn to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter number 22. 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse number 7 says this, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. So notice there that it's likened again unto gold, but it's saying that the trying of your faith is even more precious than gold. You know, it perishes. It says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So again, likened unto gold. And, it, and what, is it, what is the response that he wants us to have? Glory. Glorying is rejoicing. That's what that is. It's like, it's like praise, oftentimes. Like we saw, you know, but rejoice in 1 Peter 4. So don't think that it's strange. The correct response should be rejoice. But rejoice. In Romans 5, you know, it said that we glory in our tribulations. And it goes on, it says, and rejoice in hope. So notice, glorying is rejoicing. What is it saying that, that God wants us to do after we go through a trial or a problem or a tribulation? God wants us to rejoice and to be happy. Why should you rejoice and be happy? Because you're learning things. Because you're becoming a stronger Christian. If you're going through persecutions and trials and tribulations and hard times in your life, you should be happy. You should rejoice and understand, hey, I'm becoming a better Christian right now. I'm learning things that outside of this particular problem in my life, this tribulation or persecution, I could have never learned. If, if you haven't experienced these certain tribulations or persecutions in your life, then you're not going to be as strong of a Christian. There are, are specific lessons that you learn from these, from different types of, of persecutions that you could have never learned. Everybody here, I'm sure, you know, with the split that took place in Arizona, wouldn't everyone here say that you learned a massive amount from that? Wouldn't you say you learned a ton from that? Much, right? I know that I did, you know, maybe I can share that with you guys later, apparently. But I learned a ton of stuff. You know, I look at you know, so many different situations differently. You know, I look at, you know, the verse when Paul's talking about fightings within and fightings without a lot differently. You know, when I'm reading about disagreements between Christians and things like that, you read it differently after you've actually experienced something like that. 
You look at the sinfulness of man because you get to this point where you're at, you know, you're at church all the time and you, know, you think, well, you know, my Christian brothers and sisters are the last people that would, that would do something you know, harmful to me or hurtful to me, right? And then you understand that, hey, we're all sinful. That we all have, you know, you know, our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that flesh is still there walking with the Spirit at all times. Yet so, well, you, there are so many things. I could let, write you up a list of probably a hundred things that I you know, learned from that experience. And it was a, it was a form of a tribulation, a persecution, a trial, wasn't it? You learned all types of things. And without that, there were all these lessons that I would have never known today in my Christian life at 30 years old. I would have never experienced it. I would have never understood what it was like. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have you know, went through these trials and tribulations. And, and you know what? One response could be to give up. It could just be to quit. To stop serving the Lord. Just to become discouraged and give up. Right? But the other response would be to fight harder. To, you know, work harder on your Christianity. To, you know, read your Bible more. To go soul winning more. These are the different responses that can come about when you're going through a trial, a tribulation, persecution, whatever it may be, in whatever form that it comes. You know, you can either, two things are going to happen. I mean, it's one of two. You either give up or you work harder. That's all that it, that's going to come out of it. I'll give you a perfect example. I was just thinking about this the other day. I had started notes for this sermon, but this kind of like made me want to, want to um, preach on it even more so. I was thinking about, I don't know how it started. I think it was about like birthdays, things happening on your birthday, right? Is it funny that I'm going to tell that story? And I remember this like it was clear as day, man. Uh, you know how when you're a kid, your birthday means a lot to you. Now it's just like I'm 30. You know, it doesn't mean crap, right? It, does, it, it feels just like any other day. But when you're a child, your birthday means a lot to you. And, you know, I started playing basketball when I was fairly young and got into competitive basketball pretty quickly. And my brother went to a, what is a prep school, which is like really high caliber basketball. It was Trinity Christian Academy in Northern Kentucky. And they, they didn't play in the public school league. They traveled throughout the country and played teams like Central Park and stuff like that. Like Oak Hill Academy. If everybody's familiar with Oak Hill Academy, they played Oak Hill Academy. They had a bunch of foreign exchange students, like seven footers on the team like it was super competitive basketball well my brother's now father his his father-in-law was the coach of the team and he coached you know college basketball at a, a couple of different calibers and coaches today are not the same as how coaches were when I was younger especially this guy is like he's he's very distinct he's a, he has a very distinct type of personality I mean he's like Bobby Knight 2.0 if anybody knows who Bobby Knight is this guy has been thrown out of like I can't tell you how many basketball games he is a complete I've told brother Russell some stories the guy is a psycho he coaches uh, uh, public back uh, in the public school league now but he's way mellowed out he would go to jail if he acted today, if he acted the way that he did when he was younger, he, I'm not kidding you, he would for sure be, he'd have lawsuits against him, for sure. And he was just a rough coach. Like, I mean, he's just, he would just chew you up and spit you out. Say like the meanest stuff to you you could imagine. Like his job when you were on the court, if you made a mistake, was to like severely hurt your feelings. Like that's what it was. Like that's what he was trying to do. And you would know that there were, there were a couple of responses that people would have to this guy. One response was to like not play, you know, just to, to just basically give up, pretty much. Not, not to play harder, but to just like, they just start moping around. And I mean, that doesn't help it. You're just, now you're just like, a, you're just like a, a hurt gazelle and he just like as a lion just jumps all over you. It's way worse. And... Uh, <clears throat> there was a, on my birthday, I remember this like it was yesterday. On my birthday, I guess I would have been turning, I was trying to remember, but it would have been 11. So this was on my 11th birthday. I'm a young kid, and my birthday means a lot to me. My mom got me some new shoes, some new Jordans. I remember it so clearly. And, I, and uh, I had on like a new basketball outfit that I was wearing to practice. And I was only in the fifth grade. But because my, and my brother was already dating his daughter. So I probably received some special privileges because of that. So I was able to practice with the junior varsity. And you have to think the junior varsity in a prep school is like, you know, varsity in a public school league, you know, super high caliber. So I just get beat up all the time anyways. But I was having a real bad day this day. And it was on my birthday. 
and I was just getting knocked over constantly and that happened often anyways and I'm being pushed out of the way and I didn't get much action because I was so young when I got into the game I still even being in the game and in the practice I still didn't touch the ball very much you know nobody ever passed the ball to me it was only like these loose balls where I happened to be right there and then I'd pick it up and dribble the ball and then you know get it stolen or get a pass off quickly so I didn't get the ball very much and this but this day was just a bad day I was getting knocked over like crazy I was getting you know uh, just just everything it was terrible any anything that could have went wrong went wrong and you know so Jerry's already just tearing I'm 11 years old and I mean he is tearing me a new one man like like he is giving it to me and there was a particular time when I was like uh, was on somewhat of a fast break I was up on the fast break and um, one of the guys passed me the ball but I wasn't looking so where do you think it hit me right in the face I remember I remember it so clearly right in the face I mean he passed me the ball and I mean it just BAM just smacked me right in the, the face and Jerry's not the kind of guy I like to come over and say like hey are you okay I mean he just is like you want to come out here and practice with the big boys? I mean, that's how he is. Like, he's just giving it to me. And he's like, you want, you, you're always you know, wanting for people to pass you the ball, but when they pass you the ball, it hits you in the face. He's like, go sit down. So, I mean, I was just having the worst day already. I, you know, it made an impression on me how bad all of this just culminated. And then, bam, just getting hit in the face with the ball. And then he just comes over ripping me a new one just like screaming and yelling at me at the top of, in, you know, just at the top of his lungs. I'm sure I didn't do that justice. I didn't think about exactly what he said. And then I go over there and I sat down and I remember distinctly, and I called my dad and talked to him about it when, when we thought about this the other day. And I was, we were talking about how Jerry is. My dad's actually the one that said that he, if he acted like that today, he'd get lawsuits against him. He really would. And I called my dad and I talked to him about it. I remember something distinctly about that. I remember when I went home, I was positive I was quitting. Like, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was like, I'm done with basketball. I am done. Do you know why? What was the reason that compelled me to say I'm quitting? It wasn't because I just decided, like, hey, I'm not very good at basketball. It was just of how hard that day was. How difficult that day was. It was just like the worst day. And now looking back, obviously, it's not that big of a deal. But it was like the worst possible day it was like the worst day of my life it felt like. And I went home and I remember just thinking about it constantly. Just like, I'm, I'm not going back. I'm going to have to tell him I quit. And like he let me sit in JV. Like I actually sat on the bench. I hit three threes one time <clears throat> in a JV game. Only time I ever got in, shot the ball three times, hit three threes, was taken out of the game. They were pulverizing somebody, obviously. It wasn't a very good team. So, but... Uh, I sat on the bench, you know, I had this huge jersey, you know, this big uniform, like massive uniform that didn't fit me, and I was like, I'm quitting. I'm, I'm done with basketball, just because of how hard that day was. I obviously ended up not quitting, but those were the two, my, those were my two choices. It was either, it was either I'm just, I'm going to quit, I'm going to give up, or what was my option if I go back to practice next time? Just work harder. Just fight and play harder. And my dad said, <clears throat> one of the things my dad said that like this is what kind of you know uh, started forming these ideas in my mind even more so. My dad was like, yeah, because there was a particular time. I'll go ahead and tell you this too, where this is how Jerry was. He was way over the top. You know, I hopefully he doesn't see this sermon. But my brother in in a game one time made a mistake. And when he, he like, I don't remember what the mistake was. He made a mistake and then on top of it, you know, out of discouragement or something, he just like, I don't remember if he got a technical or something like that, but he went over to the bench and I wouldn't want anybody doing this with my kid, but this is what happened. He went over to the bench and Jerry grabbed him by his jersey and took him and slammed him up against the wall and was like screaming in his face. That's what I mean. He was over the top. He was like, he was crazy. So he'd pick up, like he broke a chalkboard. The guy's a big dude anyways. One time we were in, a, we were in, in the locker room and everybody's, you know, uh, we're, they're down and losing to a team they shouldn't have been. And he just was like, wham! And it wasn't even our locker room. And just shatters this stinking chalkboard in half. The guy was just like, he is a ticking time bomb. So he, 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 that's, that's kind of like the person he was. He grabbed my brother, threw him up against the wall. He's, you know, he, he'll, he'll rip people's jerseys off while they're sitting on the bench and like saying you're not playing the rest of the game and throw it over on the ground. I remember him doing that one time. But my dad said to me, he's like, he's like, I wouldn't have had it any other way. 
with you boys playing on a team like this? Because I was talking about how I had some rough coaches. And coaches are different nowadays anyways, but in Jerry, it didn't matter what time period he lived in. He, he's, he's a maniac. But my dad was like, I'm happy that you know, Jerry was your coach. That you grew up with that when you were younger. And then I had this dude named Coach Carr, who was my coach later on, who was kind of similar to that. And he's like, because it, it turns you into the person that you are later on in life. What it does is, it, and this is just a, a small example. What it does is when you, when you face like this severe opposition, and when you're put into an environment where it's just like, you know, it's extremely hostile. You're, you're just a lot of pressure, and if you will, persecution, trial, affliction, discouragement, your feelings are getting hurt. You know, just all these, all of this, all of this problems that are that you're facing and, and trouble that you're having to fight through, all of this, you know, opposition. You gotta, you, you have two choices. You got, you either go home on your birthday and quit, or you decide, hey, I'm coming back and I'm just gonna work harder and play harder. It, you only have the two choices, and there's no difference in the Christian life. This is what is going to happen in, in your Christian life. You will. If you, you're either not going to live a godly life. Let me give you the choices. Let me give you the different scenarios. You're either not going to live a godly life, and God's going to chastise you. Okay? So that's over on that side. Over here is, you live a godly life, and you shall suffer persecution. In the world, you will have tribulation. And when that tribulation comes, you have one of two choices. And it will be in all different types of forms. You either quit and give up, or you play harder, or you try harder, or you endure. And if you do, what happens is you come out to be a better Christian than you were in the beginning. You know, when you face those problems, when you face those trials, when you have a coach like Coach Jerry Miles, that, you know, the person that goes through that type of, of uh, treatment is going to be normally stronger in the end. Because they're, they're, they're obviously in that sense, they're being pushed to their limit. And that's what's happening in, in, in... See, when you go through your everyday Christian life, you're not having to really fight back at anything. But when you start dealing with tribulations and trials and persecutions in your life, now you're being pushed to your limit. You're having to, to, to respond and to kind of, you know... Uh, you, you're having to push back some now at this point. You're starting to exercise a little bit more. And then you find out, hey, you know, I'm able... A lot of times people are like, hey, uh, uh, in basketball and things like that, that they're able to do things that they didn't know that they were able to do. They had more potential than they did. But even still, you learn things. You learn through these trials, through these tribulations. You learn through these persecutions. I want to read Ezekiel chapter 22. R read these couple of verses and give you one last tip real quick, one last point and then we're finished. Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because ye are all become dross, behold therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it. So will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. And of course here, this is, in, this is representing the wrath of God. But one thing that I always thought was interesting, let me give you a point on this, I won't hurry and be done. So go to Matthew 13, 20. Actually, go to, go to Ephesians 3, 13. One thing that I thought was interesting about this is the fact that he throws all those different types of metals, the, the, the different metals into the fire. That's not how you do. I don't know a lot about you know, goldsmithing and things like that, but that is not how that operates. Because they have different melting points. You do not put gold and silver and tin and all these things into the fire all at the same time because they, they don't all have the same melting point. You know, uh, goldsmiths, they know how to, you know, even still without you know, the, the capabilities of electricity and digital, uh, digital operating you know, uh, uh, different mechanics, they still knew how to test the fire and see how hot something was. So they would turn the fire to a certain temperature and then they put the gold in it. And, and they turn, or they turn the fire to a certain temperature and then they put the silver in it. Because they don't have the, the same melting point. None of them have the same melting point. And I always thought about that when I read that. And then recently, 
when I was uh, when I was going over, you know, thinking about this sermon, I was thinking, what application can be made from that? And I'll tell you a good application that can be made from that: the gold, the silver, the lead, the tin. Is that the trials and tribulations? They don't just happen when you're younger. They don't just happen when you're at this certain, you know, uh, uh, level of maturity in your Christian life. They don't just happen when you're 40. They don't, they, don't, they don't only happen in the first two years. They happen when you're just 10, or iron, whatever you want to refer to it as, but then it keeps happening throughout your Christian life. All the way up into the point until you're gold, until you're being tried as silver, until you're being tried as gold. So, as long as you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you'll go through the persecutions. And it goes back to point number one in the sermon. And this is probably the most important point. Don't get to the point in your Christianity, either you're a new Christian and you just take it at face value, or this. Don't get at the point in your Christianity where you forget that this is what happens in your Christian life if you're living godly. Don't think that, there's some, that it's strange that some fiery fire is to try you. Right? Fiery trial is to try you. Know that... Persecution and tribulation and trials and afflictions are going to happen in your Christianity from beginning to end. From the time that you got saved all the way until the end that you die. And no matter what level you are in your maturity of your Christianity, you know, you're going to keep getting tried throughout life. And there's, you're never going to be perfect while you're in, on this earth. You're just going to keep... Let it, getting, getting rid of the impurities and keep getting rid of the dross. So you turn to Ephesians 3.13. We'll end in Ephesians 3.13. The Bible says this, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. I want you to notice that. That ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Tribulations are a good thing. God has certain tribulations for you. Everybody here has their own problems and flaws and, you know, areas where they're weak in their Christianity or maybe they're new in their Christianity. Everybody has areas where they need to improve in their Christianity. And there are certain tribulations and trials and persecutions that are the only things that will fix that for you. That's why he says, he doesn't want us to faint, he says, at my tribulations for you. So these tribulations are for you. They're a good thing. Don't be surprised. Embrace them. And don't give up, because there's only two responses. You either give up, or you fight harder, or you try harder, or you endure. Those are the only two options. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the examples of the prophets in the Old Testament, dear Lord. We thank you, dear God, for, uh, for the Word of God that can always, uh, in whatever uh, issue or whatever uh, um, you know, problem that we might be having with afflictions and persecutions, we can, we can find it in the Bible. We can find somebody that went through it. We can find the answer in the Bible to help us through all the different trials of life, dear God. Uh, we ask you that you would uh, uh, be with every individual here, be with the visitors, and, and be with uh, all the families of the church, uh, that you would bless any infirmity, uh, that you would uh, just help us all as Christians just to desire to become a better Christian uh, each day and to push forward, to, to not be complacent with where we are, and to, uh, uh, to, to not uh, uh, you know, just, just be happy with the state of our Christianity today, but to always want to better ourselves and help us to embrace the, the tribulations and the trials and to understand that they're good for us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>